Dr. Lena as well. And thanks also to Sinfri um, for inviting me here today. I'm really delighted to, to be here with everybody. Um, as I was saying uh, before everyone was let in from the waiting room, I haven't, because of the time difference, been able to attend these sessions um, physically or personally much in the past at all, but I have uh, greatly enjoyed and profited from the YouTube recording. So thank you very much for asking me to, to be here today. Um, and before I start properly, I should just, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today uh, from Sydney in Australia, which is stolen Aboriginal land. I'm on the land of the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation land that has never been ceded by them to the European invaders and land that's been a site of a bloody struggle and dispossession since 1788. And I think it's just important to begin by acknowledging that. Okay, well, um, I don't want to keep this, I don't want to make this overly formal. Um, I suppose that the guiding question that uh, is behind the, the, the chapter that that was uh, circulated with today's talk is really the question of what kind of linguistics do we need in an era of accelerating climate catastrophe and mounting authoritarianism? And in asking that point, that question, my point isn't to suggest that the investigation of language should be subordinated to explicit political agendas or that ideas about what language is like um, should be answered on political or non, or, or at least on, on non-intellectual non criteria. Um, scholarship shouldn't be politically instrumentalized. Academic research has to take its own course without any sort of external interference. But nevertheless, um, ideas about language are of course already political. Um, the, the way that we approach language intellectually is a product of politics. It's inevitably shaped by the background social situation that we're in and the interests that are at work, work in it. Um, and in turn, it contributes in all sorts of subtle but none, nonetheless real ways to, to that, that overall social situation. And I suppose my thought is that, that when we find ourselves in a situation as serious as the one that we're in today, it would be sort of irresponsible, I think, not to ask about the political valencies and the social valencies of the ideas about language um, that we perpetuate uh, in virtue of our membership of the discipline of linguistics. And of course, I recognize that not everybody here by any means um, is, is a practicing linguist. Um, something that has always struck me about my discipline is the extent to which concerns like, like the one that, that I've just mentioned are, are absent on the whole from the mainstream of, of the discipline. Uh, the kind of linguistics that is taught in, in the so-called core of undergraduate linguistics programs. Um, and I think we can, we can profitably ask what it is about that discipline of linguistics that, that insulates it so thoroughly um, from the kinds of wider political and social and ideological concerns that, that I think are, are interesting and certainly worth, worth investigating. Why is linguistics so unable or unwilling to contemplate its own ideological and political properties? That's, I think, an interesting question to ask. And certainly, if we compare linguistics to other disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, it seems to me that the prominence of those questions in linguistics is much, much less than it is in disciplines like anthropology, to, to take one example, um, that is otherwise in many ways close to, to linguistics. And in, in pursuing these sorts of questions, um, it seems to me to be important to, to focus on a, an essential feature of the discipline of, of linguistics as it's conceived um, in curriculum terms, at least. So as linguistics is conceived from the point of view of what 
undergraduate students simply must be taught in order to be able to be considered um, competent practitioners of, of the discipline. Um, and this feature that I think is, is so important is this idea that, that really language and languages ultimately has a single underlying form. Um, and I have a quite extended argument about this uh, in the chapter, which I'll, I'll spend the rest of the, the talk um, summarizing now. And the question is, what, what are the political or what might the political and ideological consequences be of this idea, this widespread idea that language or a language has a single form? And what I mean by that single form is simply the idea that when we teach students the canonical core subdisciplines of linguistics, when we teach them syntax or phonology or historical <laughs> linguistics, um, we typically uh, ask them to solve problems um, in, those, in those fields. We give them data sets and we ask them to get the right answer. And the whole uh, tendency of undergraduate linguistics instruction, at least in the sort of uh, the, the Anglo-American tradition that I'm most familiar with, is geared towards um, that kind of problem solving, aimed at under and aimed at uncovering the the underlying representation that is taken to constitute the real nub or core of linguistic reality. And in the chapter, I go through just some of the most important reasons that we might doubt that language is the sort of thing which it makes sense to reduce to this single kind of underlying representation. And I won't go through those arguments um, here today. Maybe the most, the most telling um, of them is simply the fact that linguists can't, any of them agree, on what any underlying forms might be, almost in any subfield of the discipline. Um, there's certainly no consensus in syntax or semantics, or for that matter, phonology or morphology about exactly what the right way of uncovering those, those putative underlying forms is. And even within discipline or even within paradigms, um, in any one of those subfields, even within generative phonology, for example, there's often dispute about what the um, appropriate underlying forms might be. And we can add to that a whole host of other considerations, all of which militate against the idea that language is this thing which um, admits a kind of discovery procedure aimed at revealing a single underlying form. So there are a lot of reasons, excuse me, I'm just gonna try and get rid of a mosquito that has been bugging me uh, literally since this started. Um, unsuccessfully, the mosquito is still in circulation, unfortunately. Um, the, the question that's interesting, I think, is, is why is this idea that language has a single form um, so persistent in the disciplinary mainstream of linguistics? And what might we think of as the ideological effects of that, of that persistence? Um, now, of course, linguistics um, and especially formal linguistics as it's practiced um, in, in, the, in the modern West, linguistics has often been accused of being a vehicle of undesirable logical effects. Um, and these have mostly, I think it's probably fair to say, centered around the discipline's theoretical investment in an individualistic, rational, and also of course, white subject. Um, and this is the subject of, of classical liberalism, essentially translated into linguistic theory. Um, and there have been many attempts to identify the ideological values that this investment conveys. And, you know, um, people have talked about the investment of the discipline in instrumental reason, in rationalism, in individualism, in what Jan Blomet calls homogeneism. Um, 
or in ethnocentrism or again colonialism. Um, so I'm not going to, and I don't have time to flesh out any of those critiques in, in detail. I just mentioned them in order to, um, to bring out the idea that the mainstream practice of the discipline is a contested one, even though that contestation has very little or almost no visibility, I would say, in the mainstream of, of, of the discipline itself. Um, but that's just one side of the story, I think, because the overt intellectual climate of linguistics is also surely, I think, mostly progressive to use a very general term. And what I mean by that is that it's overt intellectual climate is one that is opposed to discrimination and it's above all anti-racist. And I mean, if we go right back to someone like Franz Boas, um, right at the start of the discipline's modern history, I think we can see that connection very um, closely, very explicitly. Contemporary linguistics is also, of course, um, very explicitly opposed to prescriptivism. Um, so there's what we might call a sort of contradictory ideological tenor to the discipline. If we contrast on the one hand, the ideological values that it's claimed to often be the vehicle of, with, and if, if we contrast them with the overt, overt and avowed um, ideologies that are um, explicitly transmitted in the course of um, students' formation in, in the discipline. One of the points that I make in the chapter um, is that for the purposes of ideological critique of any discipline, it's really not enough to reason solely from that discipline, discipline's content. Um, it's not enough to say, okay, uh, these linguistics these linguistic ideas bear an analogy to colonialist or racist ideas, or these linguistic ideas in their content are anti-racist or anti-discriminatory. Looking at content is not enough, I think, because the, the analytical challenge for someone who wants to understand the ideological force or potential of, of a discipline is I think to account for ideological effects in a way that takes into account the processes um, that are involved uh, at the point of production uh, of, of ideological values in, in the discipline. Um, so the question should not be, what does the discipline say? It should not so much be the question of, you know, what, does, what is the intellectual content? What's the propositional content of the discipline? The question we should be asking is more uh, what processes and what habits of mind um, and what dispositions does the, the discipline try to inculcate or produce in its subjects? Um, I'm not sure whether that's clear yet, but perhaps it will become clearer um, as I specify a bit uh, what, what I actually mean by that. The hypothesis that I'm interested in exploring is the idea that undergraduate education is the most significant site of the ideological work that linguistics accomplishes. Um, and I think it's, it's reasonably, the, the reasons are reasonably obvious, I think, um, that it's, it's plausible that linguistics, different effects on students might constitute the most significant concrete influence that the discipline has in the world. Um, you know, linguistics programs internationally graduate thousands, thousands of, of, of graduates annually. Um, and if we want to talk about the effect that linguistics actually exerts in our world here and now, it seems to me that that's a very good place to look, probably a much better place, I would think, than looking at uh, works of linguistic popularization, for example, um, you know, the, the books by, by Steven Pinker or whoever it might be, which certainly do enjoy um, a certain cultural currency. But I think 
um, are a less important site of ideological sort of interpolation than the undergraduate instruction, which um, linguistic students are put through. Um, and I think it's important to start from the overall way in which linguistic theory is regularly presented to students, particularly in those parts of it that constitute the core of the discipline, because linguistic theory is essentially um, presented to students as scientific, um, as enjoying an epistemic authority which is qualitatively similar to that of the natural sciences. Um, and that's a very regular and persistent um, and deeply embedded feature of the way that linguistics under undergraduate programs present themselves um, to, to students and the public. So I think this offers us an opportunity to explore what, what Michel Foucault in his essay, What is Critique, called the ties between a naive presumption of science on the one hand and the forms of domination proper to the form of contemporary society. So what is the link between the scientific um, framing of linguistics and the manifold forms of dom domination, um, which are observable in contemporary society? And this is where the question of this unique form hypothesis comes in, because the uh, the idea of approaching language scientifically for undergraduate students means discovering the unique form that um, underlies the diversity of speech. And almost always in linguistics, intellectual effort is devoted to referring these complex and multifaceted ways we have of interacting with each other linguistically. All of those are referred to a framework of general rules. Um, in such a way that the extraordinary diversity of human languages is reduced to the operations of a unique and singular structure. And remember that, you know, I'm not, what I'm essentially talking about here is the way that the core domains of linguistics are presented to undergraduate students in their real induction into the discipline. I'm certainly not saying that this idea is never challenged, it certainly is. Um, but the core of the discipline, I think, relies on, on this supposition or presupposition that language has a unique form and what undergraduate education in linguistics consists of, to a large extent, is teaching students how to reduce linguistic diversity to linguistic uniformity. Um, so students are encouraged, I think, to acquire reductive universalizing and classificatory mental habits. Um, that's, I think, that, that was certainly a feature of my own, um, my own linguistics education. I think it's still a feature of the education that we give to undergraduates in the most important parts of the uh, curriculum where I work. I think it's a widely, I think it's, a, a, I think it's actually definitional of the discipline as it's understood uh, by most of its practitioners. So what are the effects of, of this reductive, universalizing and classificatory mental habits? And I think there are essentially two. The first is Western ethnocentrism, um, as I discuss in the chapter, um, most obvious in semantics, where there's a very widespread presupposition that if a meaning can be paraphrased or if an account can be given of the semantic representation that supposedly underlies a meaning, then that account can be given in English to all intents and purposes. Um, and Ngugi Wa Viongo's um, talk here um, recently, which wasn't directly about linguistics, of course, but uh, that, that talk brought out, I think, some of the, the issues that this presupposition might, might raise. And of course, Sinfri's own work on linguistics, I think, is also um, something that we can refer to here. So I don't really, I think the, 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 uh, the, the, the ethnocentric prejudice that is conveyed uh, by research in linguistics and the, by the fact that it's, it, it's predominantly carried out in English um, 
is probably well understood and not something that I need to um, go into in much more detail. I, I, I would, though, in the minutes that remain to me, like to talk about a different ideological consequence of linguistics pedagogy, which derives from this reductive intellectual dynamic um, that I've been talking about. Um, because fields of linguistics like, you know, phonology, morphology, syntax, historical linguistics, these are fields which revolve in their undergraduate instruction around problem sets. Um, students are mainly required to undertake concrete analysis um, in a rule governed way um, of particular circumscribed data sets. Um, they're meant to discover the rules and the representations that underlie the diversity of the surface data and that allow that diversity to be reduced to a much more economical set of underlying norms. Um, so I think one thing that we can say about this, perhaps a bit speculatively, um, is that this kind of intellectual discipline that students are subjected to models the norms of orderly, rule-governed, hierarchical and dispassionate decision-making um, that is essential to the ideology of contemporary bureaucratic administration. And in the, in, the, um, in the chapter, I draw an analogy between the linguistics reasoning that undergraduates are expected to um, assimilate and the principles of bureaucracy that Max Weber um, articulated in the 1940s. So my suggestion, which is a speculative one, of course, is that the kinds of um, rule-based reasoning that students are encouraged to, uh, to acquire sort of naturalize and provide a kind of intellectual license for the kinds of bureaucratic instrumental reason that are ubiquitous in modern administrative processes. Um, Linguistics pedagogy, I think, arguably suggests that these processes replicate the very ones that are constitutive of rationality itself. So the second thing I think we can say about the way that this reductive aspect of linguistics undergraduate training operates, this, this attempt that students are always asked to make to reduce everything to a single unique form the last thing I think we should say about it is that this creates a tension between, on the one hand, the search for a unique representation of linguist, underlying linguistic form, and on the other hand, the, the fact that multiple analyses of any theoretical problem can always be in, envisaged. So often within a single paradigm, there are several correct solutions um, to any given data set, that's just a general feature of the underdetermination of theory by, by evidence. That's a general feature of empirical inquiry in any kind of um, empirical venture. So there's that. But then also there's the question of the choice of framework. Um, the fact that uh, there's an essentially discretionary choice that's open to linguists about what the governing parameters will be of the um, theoretical framework that they adopt. No one tells you you have to be a generative linguist or a cognitive linguist or a proponent of the natural semantic meta language. Um, you get to or or a or a proponent of systemic functional linguistic or West West Coast functionalism. You get to choose this essentially, um, or you're forced into it through institutional contingent institutional um, considerations. But nevertheless. Um, Maybe the way to put this is that there's a high degree of theoretical arbitrariness in the discipline. Um, and there are, there's a whole variety of competing accounts of what the, best, what the best analysis of a particular empirical phenomenon in linguistics is. And there's really no agreement across the discipline about what these underlying forms look like or the way that we should discover them. But how does that pan out in the classroom? In the classroom, the academic is essentially free to impose their particular vision of, um, of the discipline on their students. Um, and the, the academic has the license to 
the academic is not accountable for their choices of theoretical framework, um, for which they are likely to nevertheless make often quite unequivocal claims of scientificity. Um, I mean, Pierre Bourdieu somewhere in, in a passage that really struck me talks about philosophy as a site of uh, a massive amount of theoretical differentiation, each aspect of which claims to hold the uh, unique key to understanding how the world is. Um, and I think we can say something rather similar about linguistics. It's this jockeying field of um, in differing interpretations, all of which um, claim at least implicitly, but often explicitly as well, the status of scientificity for themselves. Okay, I'm almost finished. How, how is this, this relevant? It seems to me that in the linguistics classroom, as in many other parts of the humanities, um, students quickly learn that linguistic experts can claim authoritative scientific or empirical uniqueness for their preferred theoretical framework, even in the absence of disciplinary consensus. So the Chomskyan gets to say, this is how language is like. The cognitive semanticist gets to say, this is how language is like, and, and so on and so on. And those, um, those claims that arise within contested discipline, within contested subfields of the discipline, are usually not presented to, ling to linguistic students as contested. They are usually presented as the way we're going to do things here. Um, and, you know, so there's a very interesting article by Aaron um, Lawson, if I remember that correctly, from some years ago now, um, uh, about linguistics textbooks, in which he shows the way that there's this discretionary authority operative in which the textbook author is essentially dispensed from any accountability or any need to justify his or her choice of overarching theoretical paradigm. Um, and my suggestion is, and I will end on this point, that this exercise of arbitrary discretionary authority that is modeled for students in the linguistics classroom is this is the most important ideological consequence of linguistics, I think, because it habituates students to a certain spectacle of arbitrary or th symbolic authority. Um, the lecturer gets to claim to students that language is as they think it is. Um, they've chosen their, their, their paradigm, language is as it is, and they get to enforce that choice on students by examining in them, them in it and giving them marks in it. And students are required to submit to and assume this particular way of exercising arbitrary symbolic power um, in the domain of theory by gradually accepting the scientific pretensions of a basically discretionary and subjective intellectual practice. Um, Students studying linguistics are, are encouraged to develop generalizations and theories about linguistic aspects of our world in a highly reductive and abstract way, subject to fairly lax empirical controls. Um, and what academics do as they teach students to do this is they validate their own theoretical preferences and effectively shelter them from serious contestation. Um, and what academics do in that is um, they model for students the ways that claims of scientificity, reason, and empirical responsibility can be deployed to legitimate individual sovereign instruments, interests. Um, and it seems to me that so there's an arbitrariness of just there's an there's an arbitrariness of justification to which students are subjected in the theoretical order. Um, and that, I think, serves to model for them the arbitrariness of the material and political order outside it. Um, you know, students are taught linguistics at the point prior to which they're just about to enter the labor market. When they finish their linguistics degrees, they will go off and try and get jobs. The arbitrary authority of the, linguist, the linguistics lecturer in the classroom, 
I'm suggesting is not unrelated to the arbitrary authority of the employer, the landlord, the political representative, each of whom in their own ways deploys a certain um, claim of naturalness or necessity to justify um, their own essentially discretionary and interest-based choices. Um, so linguistics, education, whatever its other effects, I'm suggesting, plays a role in normalizing the unjustifiable and unaccountable exercise of power. I don't think that's the only thing that it does, but I do think it's one thing that it does, which we don't talk about nearly as much in the discipline as we should. And that's why I'm, I'm so grateful to you for having asked me to come here today. I hope I've been clear enough, and I'm sorry if I've slightly exceeded the time that I was allotted. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, Sinfrey? Oh, Nick, thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Um, I got to, like I said, to know your work through, um, through John Joseph, and it's good that John is around, um, because I think some of the ideas that I'm going to raise, he may approach them from a different uh, angle. Um, Currently at Penn State University, for example, in the Department of Applied Linguistics, um, we are increasingly interested in setting up um, a minor in applied linguistics or something like that. But listening to your talk and reading some of your work, I'm led to ask the following question, which I think you ask yourself as well. Is there a way in which linguistic theory feeds in a kind of politics which most linguists would oppose? In other words, is, are, are you saying that um, linguistic, the teaching of linguistics is to some extent a harmful project? Yeah. So Yes, I sort of am saying that, Sinfrey. Yes, I, th I think it's a contradictory project. And I think that contradictory character is entirely characteristic of most ideological formations that um, we care to examine in any depth. Um, I think linguistics has an overt ide ideology, which mm -hmm. students are often explicitly um, encouraged to embrace. So that's the mm -hmm. ideology which says, you know, there's no such thing as prescriptive grammar. Mm -hmm. The way that people teach, the way that people speak is the way, there's nothing wrong with the way people speak. What, what our role as linguists is, is to uh, just describe mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. the natural ways of, of speaking that people adopt. All of that is entirely unobjectionable. Mm -hmm. But then in a sort of suspicious reading, I suppose, what I'm suggesting is that there are so many dimensions of the intellectual tools that we bring to that uh, task of description mm -hmm. and explanation mm -hmm. that cut in the opposite direction yes. for, for yes. the kinds of reasons that I've, I've explained in the paper. So mm -hmm. yes, I think there are as harmful aspects to linguistics education, and that's not surprising. I don't think that as you know, linguistics, like anything, is this very complex disciplinary, social, intellectual formation. It would be astonishing, I think, if we could just um, give it a, uh, uh, a diagnosis of, or a, if we could give it a clean bill of health completely. Mm -hmm. Linguistics is like everything else. It's contradictory. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't assume that it's just good. I think everything in the structure of academic professionalism Mm -hmm. encourages us to think that we can do no wrong, you know, <laughs> we're all, mm -hmm. um, but and I think if, we, should, yeah. we should think otherwise. Yeah. And if that is the case, then what I want to explore with you is this, what is the image of society which an 18, 19 year old student has after attending courses in phonology, morphology, syntax, etc. What sort of idea about how society functions does that student um, end up with after they've attended all these courses in, in morphology, syntax, and all that, and they've perhaps 
been taught some trope scale linguistics or vico scale linguistics. What I'm interested in, to, which I want to explore with you is what at the end of the day is the image of society and how individuals in society relate to each other. Does this student end up with after having gone through this, such a curriculum? I'm not interested in the expertise that they will have to become a phonologist or, 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 or a specialist in morphology, but what are the ideas about society which are conjured in their mind after having gone through this nature or after having gone through such a curriculum? Yes, that's an excellent question. I mean, obviously we can only speculate. Yes. We don't, we don't know for sure, but we can mm -hmm. speculate, we can draw inferences on the basis of things that students tell us or ways that they behave. But obviously mm -hmm. the answer to that question is always going to be interpretive. So, and yes, there's going to be yes, a speculative yes. element to it. So it's mm -hmm. important to say that. I mean, I, I'm, I suppose I just go on my experience, both as a student and now as, uh, as someone who teaches linguistics mm -hmm. disciplines. And I think the thing that always struck me as a student was an intense awareness of the sort of arbitrariness mm -hmm. of many of the sort of theoretical moves which are made in class, but mm -hmm. which are nevertheless presented to students as in some way either necessary or as validated by a greater sort of scientific reason or authority. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how often when one uh, you know, listens to a talk in linguistics or even a lecture in linguistics, how often does one think, yes, but, or one thinks, well, you don't have to say that. You could say that a different way, or it might not be that reason. It might be this other reason. The whole, for any, any proposition, there's always this field of alternatives of greater or lesser sort of plausibility that pops up at the same time. And I think that the most important thing perhaps that students think learn about society is that when they're in the linguistics classroom, what they see is that the lecturer can just enforce, <laughs> you know, a one particular version of reality. The, the lecturer has this demiurgic, you know, uh, uh, quality in that they get to say how the world is. You know, Bourdieu mm -hmm. and Passeron in one of their books make this... Um, very clear. They, they're talking about high school education, but I think the point does carry over to um, university education and in the humanities as well. The teacher controls everything. The mm. teacher gets to say how the world is, even when reason very clearly shows that it, it needn't just be like that. It could be another way as well. It might even be able to be the opposite way to the way the teacher presents it. So this seems to me a very basic example of the exercise of arbitrary power. Um, and I think it's striking the extent to which the particular theoretical options that linguistics lecturers have taken are never really foregrounded as options to their students. You know, what the lecturer says is, look, we could do this problem or we could approach this topic in all sorts of different ways, but I'm not interested in those ways. I'm interested in this way. And this is the way that I'm going to teach you. And you have to do it this way. And once that conversation has happened, the rest of the semester or the term just proceeds down this track where the student is taught that this is the way that we do it. Um, and they have to accept that. And that seems to me to be very influential on students. It was influential on me. And I think one of the things it suggests to them is that authority figures are allowed or part of what authority is or part of what power means is the ability to just do what you want and impose it on others <laughs> um, and you're never you never have to be accountable for that and that is the same sort of authority that students confront <clears throat> with their landlords with their employers these are in both cases we have unjustifiable forms of domination i would argue which are naturalized with reference to these much wider ideological values um, in a similar way to, to the way that uh, theory choice is naturalized in, in linguistics education. This is how it seems to me anyway. I'm interested, I'll be interested to hear whether yeah, people yeah. agree with me. Okay. Yeah, let me just make uh, raise two uh, issues, then I will open up to the rest of the 
of the audience. I want to give you uh, an anecdote of my own income, my first encounter with linguistics. I did my first degree in linguistics at the University of Ghana. And we were introduced during that phase to uh, transformational generative grammar. But there were a lot of mosquitoes um, buzzing around. And we always used to wonder why the linguistics that we were doing did not seem to have any relevance whatsoever um, to the mosquitoes that we were dealing with, et cetera. And I've never been able to resolve the all the, the nature of the conflict or tension between generative grammar and mosquitoes. One in my next life, I'll start off my career with that. Then the point I want to raise, which I think is interesting to me, is this. If linguists don't generally agree on the object of analysis, this thing called language, what should applied linguists do? When I was thinking about this question, I went back to some of the early work by Henry Widdowson, in which he then first argues that perhaps instead of linguists relying on, applied linguists relying on what linguists say about language, they should form and create their own understanding about language, which perhaps, yeah, I don't know what you think about. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question, I think, because, I mean, what strikes me is the fact that people were writing grammars and uh, dictionaries of languages, and they were teaching yeah. languages and learning languages and using languages for practical purposes long before theoretical linguistics came along and purported to provide them with tools that facilitated that task. So there's a sense in which applied linguistics is much older than theoretical linguistics, yes, just, yes, just yes, to the extent yes, that, you know, yes, people have been yes, coping with language yes, since time immemorial. Yes, um, yes. And I don't think there's any doubt that theoretical yeah. linguistics has contributed some useful tools, like the notion of yeah. a phoneme, I think, yeah, is yeah, 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 important, yeah. important um, intellectual development for applied linguistics as well. Mm. But there's there is a lot to, there's a, a real question, I think. I mean, you, you see it, don't you? It's not just in applied linguistics. You see it in applications of linguistics in language automation. So, you know, the kinds of theory that are, are um, advanced and taught in theoretical linguistics really have very little to do with the kinds of um, processes that uh, engineers use for processes like, you know, automatic translation or, or, or data retrieval from corpora. Linguistics is all very remote from those concrete applications as well. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of a problem for the, the theoretical yeah. wing of the discipline. And I, I think it's a good idea that applied linguistics might consider you know, itself not as a sort of this subaltern sort of applied yeah. Yeah. You know, poor cousin yeah. of of the Chomskyans and the Langakirians mm. and all of these exalted, exalted thinkers, but it might it might be a discipline in its in its own right. Yeah. And certainly that the translanguaging movement, which emerged mm. from yeah. applied linguistics, I think is one of the most exciting, yeah. you know, sites of theoretical renewal in the dis in the theoretical discipline at the moment. So that's an example of how the flow of ideas can go from the applied side to the theoretical side. Yeah. Okay, let me just say something, then I hand over to John and Joseph, because um, you may have something to say, then we move on. Um, I think I agree with you that the applied dimension of applied linguistics preceded historically the emergence of theoretical applied linguistics. Anyway, John, what's your view? <clears throat> um. I, I don't have anything to add, but uh, Salikoko Mufwene has his hand up. So okay. I, my view is that we should turn over to him. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I said. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Nick, um, I think you put your finger on a deeply entrenched legacy from Ferdinand de Saussure. Mm -hmm. And according to him, all members of the community <laughs> share an identical linguistic system. And that's why we understand each other. 
but that is a disconnect with reality. <laughs> there, are, there is a subset of cases where people in the same household <laughs> speaking the same language and have such a long experience with each other, fail to understand each other. And we understand each other basically because we cooperate. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have a conflict in the same household and yes. partners living together know this, mm -hmm. everything you say becomes <laughs> wrong. <laughs> And you can say, that's not what I intended. And that's not what I heard. You just said it. And, and this is part of reality. Yeah. And there's something else in um, linguistics, this notion of idiolet. We have uh -huh. really underused it. Mm -hmm. And we have different idiolects, first because we are not anatomically or physiologically identical. Yeah. We are not mentally identical. Mm. We don't have identical life experiences from which yes. we have developed our um, linguistic competence. Yeah. Therefore, we have to come up with a different explanation for why we understand each other mm -hmm. most of the cases. Mm. Mm. That's not necessarily because we have identical systems now with computers, we should think, you know, what, with, what has been produced with one particular brand of computers is not completely translatable into how another brand of computer works. And between us speakers and signers, it's more or less the same experience. So that's something that, any professor of linguistics should be attuned to. Mm. And that's why when you give homework to students, you can expect all sorts of analysis. Mm. And the position shouldn't be, I'm the professor, therefore my analysis is the one that prevails. But it should be, why did this student come up with this different kind of interpretation? Is everything wrong in it? Or there's something that really makes sense to which we should pay attention. And my conclusion has been we understand each other, not because we operate with identical systems, but because each of our systems is capable of making sense of what has been produced by another speaker or signer. What do you think? Um, yeah, I'm very sympathetic to lots of that. Thank you. Um, maybe maybe the, the, the aspect that I have the clearest thoughts on is the notion of, of, of idiolect. Um, to me, even the notion of idiolect is something that we might want to, uh, to complexify in the sense that I'm uh, sympathetic to the idea that there is no unique description of any single set of linguistic data, whether that's the set of utterances produced by a whole linguistic community or the set of linguistic utterances that's just produced by a single person. Something in me wants to hesitate to say that, you know, you and I, for example, Salikoko, have different idiolects, because I'm not sure that, uh, because to say that um, introduces a, a determinacy in the characterization of each of our individual ways of, of languaging. I, I prefer to say that, uh, you know, the way that I speak and the way that you speak are each susceptible of a very large number of different interpretations and descriptions. And if, if and I think that's true. And I think if that's our starting point, if um, then it becomes less sort of useful to talk about us each having different idiolects because what that does presuppose is that there, we each have a single grammar underlying our, our, our utterances. It's just that those grammars are different. That's why we say we each have a, a, a different idiot. Like we've got different unique grammars. And I want to block that move. I want to block that move that says there is a single unique description of, 
uh, a particular style of talking, because I think that um, I think that linguistics isn't essentially a hermeneutic discipline. I think it's one which is about interpretation, and I think interpretation is essentially pluralistic. There is always more than one way of describing how any one person talks or how any one set of linguistic facts can be described. And the idea of an idiolect strikes me as um, rather as going in the opposite direction to that. Is that, have I, am I making myself clear there? Um, that, that's, the, that's what I have clearest thoughts on about your very, your, your very interesting set of questions. So thank you. Yeah, I hope that's, I hope that's something. <laughs> I, I agree with your answer, and I must ad admit my uh, soft underbelly of South Syrian linguistics <laughs> that I haven't completely purged away from me. Um, did I hear you t use the term languaging? Uh, yes, I did say that, yes. Okay, and, and I, I like that because that's something that is consistent with what is going on in the sense of complexity in emergence. In other words, we are always in the process of producing what we call language. And that is not a uniform process and it is internally variable. And, but variable in a way that I believe even variation in sociolinguistics, uh, 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 sociolinguists have not captured yet. Because variation is sociolinguistics is still predicated on Sosyrian sociolinguistics. Or Sosyrian yeah. linguistics, I'm sorry. I can't really say very much about studies of variation because I, I, I don't know really anything about them. Um, but I would certainly, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sort of conscious that I have, the people that I've referred to so far have all been dead white European males, you know. Foucault, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I was just, the reason I say that is that I'm, I'm, a bit, I, I'm a Wittgensteinian in these questions. I think that, you know, uh, what the role of the linguist is, to, to, is, is to describe very closely the different language games that we play. Um, that's what grammatical description means for Wittgenstein. Um, and we should block the move um, to trying to step behind the surface of ordinary language in order to find something more simple or more explanatory that lies behind it. Because that's not something that I think we can do um, at the same time as we remain in this sort of humanistic, hermeneutic affair uh, domain of um, explanation. There are certainly a scientific explanation for language behavior, which is no doubt available. But if we want to go on playing our humanistic game of, you know, ph of philosophy and linguistics, I think it's a mistake to try and find something simpler than, la than ordinary language, which lies behind ordinary language and explains it. So whether that's an idiolect or universal grammar or syntax or grammatical rules, whatever it is, that's the sort of move that, I, that is uncongenial to me. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. We have a question from um, Christine. Um, she observes that there is uh, a disconnect between uh, descriptive training based on rules and all of that, especially at the postgraduate level, and uh, students' practices, and where students will eventually end up professionally post-graduation, and that's typically in education. Now, she wishes to know what role you see ideology, language ideology playing in that disconnect between the focus and the training and the sort of prototypical workplace graduates of that training find themselves working in. Right, thank you, yes. Um, I'm not entirely sure what to say about that. I mean, Perhaps one thing I can say is that uh, those linguistic students who go on to become foreign language teachers do find themselves, I would have thought, um, having to embrace the sort of unique form hypothesis because they have to tell their students what the right way to speak the target language is. Um, 
but they're in a, a very different sort of game from the game that the theoretical linguist is in. Theoretical linguist is um, trying to discover explanatory principles and generalizations that account for surface forms. The second language teacher is essentially trying to specify what the correct surface forms are um, without being worried about what the, the theoretical explanation for them is. So I'm not sure that I uh, understand, um, Christine, I'm not quite sure that I understand the part of your question um, which is which is about students' practices. Are, are you suggesting that are you suggesting that the the teacher who's come with a general linguistics training is then confronted with a whole lot of students who who whose linguistic practice is incompatible or is too various to make the idea of a single grammatical form plausible? Is that is that the idea? I'm sorry if I'm being obtuse. Um, Christine, would you like to clarify? Yes, still... I was just typing there. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks a lot. I was just thinking about uh, teaching mother tongue, for example, in Brazilian context. Uh, people are much more worried about Paulo Freire's ideas, teaching how to read and write, and language as social practice than describing language. That was the context. Oh, okay, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, I mean, I th look, I think that's, that speaks to the, um, that speaks just to the, the, uh, the, the issue that Sinfri also raised of, you know, how, what is the relationship between theoretical and applied linguistics? And I think there are other people um, in this room who have much more to say about that than I do. Um, theoretical linguistics is aimed at a, an abstract kind of explanation and understanding. Um, and I think there's no shortage of examples to show that that kind of abstract understanding and explanation um, is often quite remote from the kinds of practical problems that uh, language pedagogy involves. I think that's, um, that's the same. It's the, you know, if you, if you study uh, ethics in philosophy, um, you're not necessarily at all equipped to advise people about how they should act in real life. Um, I think it's the same kind of very characteristic theory practice split um, that is familiar in lots of different domains. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, Moneta, would you want to pose a question directly to Nick? Uh, okay, Moneta says uh, they are they are good. Um, they don't have any uh, further questions to ask. Well, maybe I could just uh, pose one to you, Nick. Um, is the scientificity of linguistics the association with uh, rules, predictability, and all of that being pressed? into the service of a contemporary political order. Um, is that, is it, couldn't one also explain it in terms of the history of, fetishiz uh, of fetishizing the sciences? I mean, um, classical Newtonian physics as the model science, rules, predictability, and all of that, um, I think in the early 1920s, Edward Sapie even wrote an article called, um, I think, the status of linguistics as a science. So I uh, really, in the, in the history of the discipline, and in fact, in several disciplines, there has been this embrace of uh, physics as the model science and many disciplines to gain respectability have kind of embraced the, uh, the, the, the principles, the approaches in the natural sciences. But paradoxically, physics itself, which was the model science, has moved away from rule-based predictability to, if you look at work by uh, um, Heisenberg, he even talks about the uncertainty principle. So physics itself has moved away from some of the 17th, 18th century um, principles 
that somehow linguistics has maintained, at least formal linguistics has maintained that tradition. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the, 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 the rule governed nature of linguistics, which we see today is actually continuing a certain tradition. So it is not only being pressed into the service of a political or social order uh, today. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it's interesting. O obviously, I think it's, th there is a physics envy. There is a physics envy in, in linguistics, which manifests as a, as a general fetishization of science. And I think that comes from a general lack of understanding of the epistemological status of, mm. of, of statements in linguistic theory. I think, you know, it's a, it's a young discipline and it's modern guys. And I don't think we yet really understand very well um, what the source of that, the intellectual value of our practices is. Um, it's interesting, I think, that the linguists that I know hardly ever refer to physics, but they see themselves, when they contextualise themselves, I think they're very likely to see, to talk about the relationship between uh, linguistics and, you know, population geography or biology or zoology. These are the sciences that are most salient, I think, for linguists who do descriptive work on underdescribed and minority languages, for example. And I think that, that um, the, there's, a, there's a real taxonomic and quantifying drive um, that I think I see everywhere in, in field linguistics and descriptive linguistics. Um, and if I had to identify the, uh, if I had to identify the um, scientific ideology that was most present in contemporary linguists of the, of the kind that I have most to do with, I would say that there's a very persistent kind of positivism that, that, character, that characterizes linguistics research, which is an orientation to, uh, to things that are taken to be um, uh, definite facts, definite facts. That's how scientism manifests itself most prominently, I would say, in the contemporary discipline. There's this assumption that what the linguist is doing is uncovering um, ob objective positivistic facts in the same way that um, a, a, a physical scientist is doing. Not a physicist, but, you know, a zoologist or, uh, you know, somebody who, somebody who does basic sort of quantitative research. And what that perspective marginalizes entirely is the idea that the descriptive linguist might be in a relationship to language of the same kind that a literary critic, for example, is with relation to a literary text. So we tend to think that those two things are entirely different. You know, the aim of literary studies is not to discover the truth about King Lear. The aim of literary studies is to multiply interesting new interpretations of canonical texts. We don't think of linguistics like that. We think of linguistics as discovering facts about language, not as offering interesting new interpretations of them. Um, and that seems to, it's that presupposition, that ant, sort of, it's a sort of anti-hermeneutic presupposition. Do you see what I mean? It's saying that the linguist is not fundamentally offering interpretations which other linguists should disagree with. They're ultimately trying to discover the truth of the matter in a, in a positivistic fashion. That seems to me to be the way in which a scientific ideology is most manifest in, in, in the, the, the kinds of the discipline that I know about anyway. I'm not sure whether that's a satisfactory answer, Bessie, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, um, Diana Lassen Freeman has yes. a hand. <coughs> yes, <laughs> this is, uh, thank you so much, Nick and everyone. This is wonderful and so many ideas. that. I could probably consume the remainder of <laughs> time, but let me just say that I came of age into linguistics, uh, not as an undergraduate, but as a young postgraduate <laughs> student. And it was at the time that generative grammar was supreme. Uh, 
I mean, in many linguistic departments, not only my own. Watch the stranglehold it had, not just on the students, but the professors, some of whom who, who subscribed to other theories, some of whom were quite eminent, um, like, uh, like my own, Kenneth Pike, who had difficulty getting published because of the stranglehold of and the dominance of generative grammar. In those days, transformational generative grammar. And I, um, I mean, it was interesting. It was a valuable lesson. I mean, it led, you know, in some ways <laughs> that um, total domination gave a lot of us something to push back against, um, but that's not a reason to maintain the stranglehold. But I wanted to go on and say that, uh, like Sally, I subscribe these days to emergentism and complexity theory. It's another theory. <laughs> it's an umbrella that's big enough to embrace many different views. I think the thing about applied linguistics, as I understand it, and as I think is defined by Chris Brumfitt, among others, is that we start from a problem orientation. We start from what is the problem we're trying to solve rather than what is the theory that we bring. Um, uh, I coined the term grammaring, Solly. I mean, because a long time ago, I saw the problem was teaching grammar uh, to second language students, to language students uh, in a very Caesarean way, uh, rules and exercises and that sort of thing. And then they couldn't use it, right? They weren't able to adapt it to a changing situation. They couldn't mold their language resources as they needed to do. And so I coined the term grammaring and talked about the ways in which we could teach it more dynamically. But my point coming back to the problem orientation is then once you, and it's not a one time, I shouldn't say that, but having defined a problem, you, you then have uh, a, a lot of tools in your toolkit if you're exposed to very different ways of looking at language. And so the materials that I prepared for language teachers have been very eclectic um, uh, because I think different theories have different strengths and can help uh, us when we're trying to deal with these problems. But I do not want to leave the impression that applied linguistics is a theoretical. It's certainly not. And we have arcane theories ourselves. Um, and then to your very last point, um, I'm also interested in second language development and complexity theory comes, plays a, a role in that. And uh, we are in our field being encouraged to um, replicate studies in order to validate studies. And some of us have just written an article um, and submitted it to a journal at the invitation of the journal, arguing that replication doesn't make sense. You're never going to do, you're never going to find the same results a second time. Plays are different, the time is different, all of that. And so, so certainly an anti-positivistic uh, stand, I think is one that's going to help us a lot with dealing with the problems that we've identified. Um, so much more, thank you very much for a rich, rich talk and rich morning experience. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the problem of replication is a fascinating one, I think, um, because it's, and it's reasonably often commented on, I think, by linguists themselves, that, you know, replication, as a matter of fact, is very rarely enforced in the discipline. No one, someone goes out into the field and comes back with a shiny new grammar of a little described language. No one else is going to go and check whether it's accurate or not. It's immediately accepted as um, you know, once it's published, it's immediately accepted as an authoritative record of the language. So this is a sort of instance of this sort of demiurgic or discretionary kind of impetus that, that I think is, is everywhere in, in, in the discipline. So I think you're, you're quite right to say that, uh, you know, to, to highlight the incongruity of appealing to replicability as a sort of epistemological um, epistemological sort of criterion for the discipline because it just doesn't exist yet we we or at least that's an exaggeration it often doesn't exist um yet we uh we persist in thinking of ourselves as uh as researchers who are subject to that kind of um constraint and who have who have the authority that that derives from it as well so it's a it's a paradoxical situation i think Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, Cliff, would you want to pose your question to him, to Nick? 
Okay. All right. Um, actually, what I was saying was that uh, uh, what is the what is his thinking around the uh, interdisciplinary work, where whereby uh, the field of linguistics is used is usually utilized uh, in other areas like psychology or computer studies, and, uh, and and or maybe even trying to answer colonial or historical problems that have been uh, going on and resulted in inequalities. So in other words, not to look at it as maybe the grand or classical discipline of linguistics, but rather as a, a field that is moving or is evolving, but just adapting to other disciplines. I thought I, thought I would like to hear more of your thinking around uh, interdisciplinarity or maybe transdisciplinarity for that case. Right, thank you. That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure that I have anything very well developed to say about it. I suppose, I mean, maybe it's worth starting uh, by noting that, you know, the modern discipline, I mean, and John can correct me if I'm saying something wrong here, but the, the, the modern discipline in many ways started with Saussure asserting very strenuously the need for linguistics to be an autonomous and self-standing discipline, mm -hmm. which was independent from um, those other kinds of uh, connections. So Saussure wanted to carve out a space for linguistics, which was which was independent and which was disciplinary, and without those those other kinds of um, affiliations. I mean, you know, I think, I mean, obviously, there's no area, surely, of human um, activity which language is not centrally involved in, or at least in, involved in, and I think um, it would be. Uh, it would be ludicrous for um, linguists not to think that they can contribute to, to that um, or that, that ideas that have emerged in linguistics should be marginalised in other fields of academic research which, which, which deal with language. For me, I think that the real question is how much, is, is not so much how much can linguist, linguistics contribute to other fields, it's the question of how much um, should uh, linguistics learn from work that might touch on language that goes on outside its own am outside its own ambit, because to me it seems that the discipline is often quite inward looking, and um, often quite reluctant to uh, take on board ideas that might have a certain currency elsewhere in the humanities, in particular. I mean, you know, there was a great wave of critique, for example that swept over the whole of the humanities from the, you know, the, I don't know when, the late 60s, the 70s. And linguistics just remained remarkably immune to that. Um, so there is a certain kind of isolationism, I think, that characterizes the discipline. I'd be interested to know whether other people agree, agree with that. Um, so for me, that's a more salient question, I think, than the question of what can linguistics contribute elsewhere. It's how can we learn from what has been thought and discovered in, in other parts of the field. But I say maybe John wants to react to that. Um, well, I really wanted to ask you about something else, but I agree totally with what you say. And uh, uh, Diane uh, coined the word grammaring. I, I coined the word hermeneophobia as a condition <laughs> that um, we as linguists have a, a sort of fear of, of interpreting or fear of being perceived as interpreting um, rather than observing. Uh, but I, I wanted to comment, Nick, on your, um, uh, your, your very striking pessimism uh, about uh, the state of linguistics. And, and I wanted to make it, I want to say something that will make it even worse. Uh, and you've experienced this as well. I, I have been, uh, this last year in particular, uh, I occasionally um, react against things like, uh, you know, colleagues of mine, because I'm uh, this year, because we've changed our curriculum on account of COVID, I'm involved in courses I haven't been involved in before. And some of them are based almost entirely on puzzles. Uh, and the view of some of my colleagues is that, you know, this, the essence of linguistics, undergraduate linguistics education is puzzles. And all the things that you were saying ring absolutely true. And, um, and, you know, I complain about the 
what you were saying about the the one answer mentality behind that. And another thing we have are um, uh, what are they called? Learning outcomes. Um, <laughs> we're we're very focused on learning. We have to define learning outcomes for each board. <laughs> and I say, well, we can't define learning <laughs> outcomes. You know, we 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 can have certain things that we'll aim for, but this is the idea is that we're controlling what the students do. And then the answer that comes back to me, and I wonder if you've had this as well, is, oh yeah, well, the things you're saying are fine for the very top students, but for the students who are just getting by, um, they, they're the ones for whom we need those learning outcomes. And they're the ones for whom we need that very directed sort of education. And, and you know, so I'm being accused of uh, elitism, but, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's not nice to be accused of. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe there's something to it, I don't know, but it seems to me that people accusing me are, sort of aiming for a vision in which there's a, an intelligentsia who should be free and then a great mass of mediocrity who need to, you know, have them put in their place and kept their, I don't know. That's uh, what I wanted to ask your advice on. I don't think I, don't think I have any advice to give you, John, but um, I mean, what that question reveals is another dimension of this whole problem, because I don't think we can talk about the, you know, ideological properties of the discipline uh, and just stay in the classroom like I tr tried to do in my talk. We have to consider the whole institutional context of the university um, that, that the classroom is situated in. And I think what you've just said brings out extremely well some very deep-seated tendencies in, uh, I was going to say the neoliberal university, but maybe it's deeper than that. I think, um, you know, there is in a lot of education a very deep contempt for students and a contempt for their, their uh, mental capacities, their ability to learn, their ability to grow. And I think a lot of human humanities education in particular um, is about forcing them to submit to arbitrary regimes of authority and control of a kind that they soon find replicated outside the, the, the university. And it's about instilling dis, you know, mental disciplines of you know, essentially compliance, um, where of course they're taught to be imaginative and to push the envelope, but never too far never too far, you know, just the, just the right amount. So yeah, I'm pessimistic too. Um, and, and I think the, what we need to look at linguistics as is a particular cultural expression of a, uh, you know, of, of bourgeois liberalism, essentially, um, that is int entirely intricated in the systems of domination and exploitation that characterize our world. And that's not, I mean, I'm not stupid enough to think that changing linguistics is going to change any of that. Obviously, it won't. Obviously, it's utterly marginal with respect to anything that actually matters politically. But I, it does occur to me that the kinds of habits of critique and the kinds of, um, you know, deference that we encourage students to adopt to arbitrary regimes of domination if we could get rid of that, we might be performing a bit of a service. If we could emancipate education and the life of the mind in linguistics, I think that would be a positive cultural contribution, um, though by no means, it would just be a cultural contribution. I mean, you know, really, I think what we need to be doing is burning down the stock exchange, actually. Um, you know, um, but that's not something that we, we are going to be doing here. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Talking about the stock exchange, perhaps I should invite the economist uh, Attila to come in with uh, his his question. Attila. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Really, it's a great opportunity to learn from you. So beautiful ideas you brought me because I've been struggling with economics, mainstream economics, as they model the function and everything that cannot be explained, you get out of the equation. So you don't consider 
social inequalities, the historical process of uh, um, slaves, people that were enslaved in Brazil for centuries. Forget about those. Just get supply and demand and a point of equilibrium. That's the price. Forget about everything. That's what I learned in my undergraduate in Rio de Janeiro. And then uh, after decades of work in reality, I felt that we need from echo poetry, uh, we need to speak to humble soils, to water, to nature, and we can learn a lot from them as we do, as we work with children, so they can think of other possibilities. So I would like to ask you, uh, how can I validate, I mean, uh, to be in the academics so that I cannot leave the academics? How can I validate uh, 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 my work uh, bringing these possibilities of integration to language, to, to communication, so that uh, economics is more, uh, is more um, makes more sense to whatever ideas we want to develop for public policies and interventions. I don't know if I could uh, bring you my, my problems. I mean, uh, in terms of alternative epistemologies and, and ways to approach those things. Thank you so much, very inspiring. Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, that's a fascinating question. And of course, um, I mean, I can't give you any, I can't say anything about eco economics. I'm, I'm barely numerate, I have to say. So, I mean, you know, I'm the last, the last person who should be saying anything about, about economics. I mean, it's, it's, I think there's a very close relationship and analogy though, between our disciplines. And I mean, it's, you can go way, way back in the history of linguistic thought. I mean, Thomas Hobbes is someone who immediately comes to mind as one of the people who asserted uh, um, an analogy between words and, and coinage or, or words, and, words and currency. That's a banal, you know, that's a banal commonplace in ideas about, in the ideas about language, that there's this fundamental similarity between words as tokens of thoughts and, and coins as tokens of, of value. So, I mean, the, the, um, there, are, there are heterodox economics. There are heterodox economists. There's the whole discipline of political economy, which tries to, re to reconceive of economics in an entirely different way just as there are heterodox forms of linguistics. And what I try to do uh, in the undergraduate teaching I do is to just simply not hide from students the fact that there are always other ways of doing things um, and that any particular theoretical proposition is almost inevitably one that is placed within a whole field of alternative possibilities and one that's shaped by the particular presuppositions that lie behind it. Um, but I think we can do that at the same time as we say, look, the particular kinds of analysis that have developed in linguistics and perhaps in economics as well, do I don't think we should say that they're completely bereft of intellectual value. I don't wanna say that, you know, generative phonology has nothing of interest. Um, I don't wanna say that, you know, Chomsky and syntax has nothing of interest. I think these are, these are, um, intellectual pursuits, which people have uh, devoted an enormous amount of energy and imagination and intelligence to, and they should be respected on that basis. Um, it's just that we should not see them as things which tell us the a singular truth about a singular language. And perhaps there's some the possibility of some kind of hermeneutic approach to that in, in economics as well. But, I, but I, I don't know, Attila, because I don't know your discipline at all. I did, I mean, there is a Sapir in economics as well. There's a Jacques Sapir, who I don't know whether anybody here has read, who wrote a, uh, wrote a book called um, Les Trous Noirs de la Pensée Économique, The Black Holes of Economic Thought. I think that was a book that was published uh, maybe 20 years ago now. And that was one of the books that when I read it, really opened up to me the idea, the possibility of a different kind of linguistics. Um, 
for many of the reasons that you're saying. So I think it would be very fruitful to, you know, explore the the, the connections and crossovers between um, linguistics and economics generally. That's an interesting that's an interesting task, I think. Which I mean, no doubt there are no doubt people here who can say much more about that than I can. That's a very I apologize for my rambling answers to these questions. I hope that's Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Nick. Uh, it's been a, a, a lively set of engagements thus far. And at this point, I'll hand over to Sinfri to round up uh, this part of the discussion. And thereafter, we proceed to the after hours party. So we are the uh, lobby of the hotel at the conference and we're having coffee. <laughs> Sinfri. <laughs> Dr. Macon, you are muted. What I'm going to try and do now for the next two or three minutes is to foreground ideas that um, I found quite interesting, which I will keep thinking about as, as we move along. I want to spend a bit of time talking about the issue of ideology and the relevance of idiolates as a sociolinguistic way of analyzing language practices. Um, it's possible that idiolates may enable us to provide valuable accounts of the nature of language practices, let's say in urban settings, which are extremely complex, heterogeneous, etc. That's um, and following what Sally was saying, what is interesting there would be if you push that argument further, the only grammars you will end up with are grammars of individual of individuals. Because my own grammar reflecting my own life history is going to be different. If that argument is valid just for what, then the question that people like Diana would do work in in grammaring have to account for is what grammars are they, whose grammars are they writing, right? Because if the only grammar is the grammar of individuals, then it's not possible for Diana to be engaged in an exercise in grammar, because that is conceptually not feasible, right? So the what is interesting there are the sort of tensions that seem to emerge within this. And then the other dimension that is quite interesting, I think, <clears throat> is that the way linguistics is taught or experienced globally may be very different. So it would be quite interesting to moving forward with the interest in languages in the global south, southern epistemologies, et cetera, to see to what extent some of these experiences uh, that we've been talking about resonate in different parts of the globe. Um, because it's possible that in non-Euro-American context, linguistics may be practiced completely different, or indeed it's possible that the same template is used across the globe. I mean, the same textbook is used everywhere else across the globe. So the sort of, um, colonial or neo-colonial uh, dimension of contemporary applied linguistics is something that I find quite, uh, quite interesting. But the, if, if there's anything that I've learned quite a lot from listening to Nick is when he was drawing a distinction, uh, when he was drawing similarities between linguistic analysis and let's say literary historians, that literal critics are interested in finding new interpretations to existing objects, for example. So if that argument is valid, what then the linguists should be interested in or applied linguists are new ways of uh, thinking. Uh, they should be interested in defamiliarizing usual common experiences. Because it is through defamiliarization of the ordinary that, that I think we are able to make 
more hermeneutic progress in linguistics or applied linguistics. Then the last thing I think, which is important to us, I think, is what then is the responsibility, which I think Nick touches, touches on, of the linguist in a post-truth world? Can a good linguist be a racist at the same time? An issue which is important given the racialized nature of the world as we move forward. Thanks, Pastor. <clears throat>